it's, it's my honor to have this opportunity to try to um, uh, offer some thoughts, some parting gifts uh, around the work that we've been doing uh, together, uh, particularly with respect to intersectionality. Um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of interesting that intersectionality is now absolutely everywhere. Um, and it's showing up in ways that I could not have possibly uh, anticipated. Um, I have seen intersectionality uh, be challenged as a religion. I have seen intersectionality as being uh, like a caste. I have seen intersectionality uh, being framed as um, the uh, 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 Olympics, the, the Olympics race, intersectionality has been used and abused wide and far over the last uh, several years. Um, so there is reason to think that even though intersectionality is now everywhere, uh, the real question is, is intersectionality uh, in a place, in a way that we can understand and use it uh, in the work that you all are doing here. Uh, in particular, the question is, do people understand intersectionality when they see it? Do they understand intersectional issues when they're presented? And do they understand intersectional work? I'm gonna tell you a true story. Um, a funder once told me um, that she was deeply impressed with the work that we do at the African American Policy Forum. Um, and I know many of you have, have been in these meetings where the grantee is really excited to come and lay out all of the wonderful things that have been done um, that they're very proud of, as I did at the time. Most of it work having to do with structural inequality, with violence, and a range of other issues. She said she was impressed, uh, but she also said she was no longer able to fund us at the level that we uh, had been funded at because she was going in a different direction. So I, of course, was keen to know what this different direction was. And she leaned in with excitement in her eyes and she said, intersectionality. <laughs> I thought she was joking <laughs> until I realized she had no idea what intersectionality actually was, even when it was staring her in the face. <laughs> That's not a good story. It's not good for funders. It's not good for grantees to have to educate our philanthropic partners about intersectionality while at the same time we're trying to do the work. I, I, does this sound familiar to anyone here? So I felt at that very moment the weight of the philanthropic performance, right? You have to uh, go in, you have to muster up the ability to do the work while at the same time trying to be polite, uh, trying to be grateful, to even be in the room, to say nothing in the face of an expression of lack of awareness even though at that moment I felt like I knew a little something about intersectionality. <laughs> so I think that as we are about to go forth and prosper, it might be useful to spend a little time enhancing our understanding of the framework of intersectionality. So all of the topics and the challenges that have been discussed over the last few days can have a concrete conceptual home. I wanna think about this as your conceptual swag bag. <laughs> the thing that you can take with you that you can put all those ideas that you've been talking about, right? Where was all that stuff? Just reach into the bag. So I wanna talk about what exactly is intersectionality and why it is important for funders to go beyond the use of intersectionality as just a mere buzzword for diversity or for the idea that, well, it's all complicated. Um, yeah, intersectionality has something to do with that, but that's not primarily what intersectionality is about. And that in turn doesn't help us understand what we need to do to more fully embody intersectionality in the world of philanthropy. So what are the broader implications? What are the challenges? I wanna offer some very brief, hopefully evocative, 
probably provocative thoughts that illustrate some of these points, I'm going to be drawing primarily from the work in which I'm most familiar, work that my research institute and public education organizations have done. But these are just illustrative. There are numerous examples of intersectionality all over the world, many of which you've been talking about over the last couple of days. As I talk about some of the illustrations that are most familiar to me, I want to encourage you to think about parallels and connections that might be closer to your own area of expertise, to your own experience. So this is intersectionality 101, what it is, why is it important, and why we have to deepen our practice. Now, intersectionality is simply a prism. It's a word picture, if you will. It's a lens. It's an apparatus to help us see issues and populations and challenges that ordinarily fall through the cracks of our awareness, fall through the cracks of our frames, fall through the cracks of our consciousness. But before we go directly into intersectionality, let's take a minute to ponder why frames are important. Frames tell us everything we need to know about a problem. They give us a sense of what is it that is in disrepair about a particular problematic social condition. It tells us who's responsible for it. It tells us perhaps what should be done um, about it. Who is it that needs to be part of the team to solve a problem? Now frames, because they are that important, really make a difference in how we approach a particular problem. So I'm going to tell you uh, a story about uh, these cows in this frame. <laughs> yes, intersectionality has something to do with cows. <laughs> these cows are sick cows. Now, anyone who's heard this uh, presentation, this part of it, don't ruin the story for everyone else. <laughs> so if I tell you with this frame that these cows are sick, the next question I'm going to ask you is, who is responsible for the sick cows? Who's responsible for the sick cows? I'm hearing it. You guys can talk louder than that. The farmer, right? So from this frame, all I'm telling you is the cows are sick. All you see um, is these cows. When I ask you who's responsible for it, you're going to interpret, you're going to use a frame to say that, well, when you see something and you say who's responsible, it's either the people who own it, or if you really want to get into it, you might say the cows are responsible for their sickness. They're probably eating the wrong grain. They're not exercising enough, you know? Some would even say that the cows are sick because there are not enough bulls in the herd, right? They're, going to be all kinds of stories um, that seek to localize the responsibility for the sick cows. This is a frame. Now when I change the frame, when I broaden the lens and ask you the same question, who's responsible now for the sick cows? Factories are responsible for the sick cows. Um, the, the local um, uh, government that may permit this level of pollution, um, all the way up to the very top uh, of our political structure, who's implicated by um, the fact that the, sick, the cows are sick. Not the cows alone, obviously, but anyone and everyone who lives in that area, anyone and everyone that comes into contact with the cows, it becomes clear that what was initially seen as a singular individual problem that had one inference about who was responsible suddenly changes when we broaden the framework. So this is just a quick example to give you a sense about why we spend a lot of time talking about frames. Frames are important because they help us see or not see what is actually at stake. So let's move to intersectionality. Intersectionality um, was a prism for actually interrogating a frame that did not allow us to see and understand a particular kind of social problem. Um, so I've told this story many times, and it's a story that keeps giving, because it's so rich 
with the awareness of what happens when we don't have frames to see certain social problems. So this is a story that begins with a woman named Emma de Graffenried and many of her sisters in St. Louis. She was uh, a black woman, she is a black woman, um, who wanted to get a better job for her family. She was a wife and she was a mother um, living uh, in St. Louis, having access only to the kinds of jobs that would barely allow her to provide uh, for her family. It was clear that a factory job, particularly a unionized factory job, would be the ticket to a better lifestyle for her family. So Emma, like many other women, went to General Motors and sought a job job, a good job um, in that plant. Um, she did not get the job that she wanted. And she, along with other black women, sued, um, basically claiming that they had been subject to race and to gender discrimination. Now, this is kind of an interesting response because the court first asked a question. Could Emma de Graffenried prove race discrimination? And the answer to that was, well, not exactly because General Motors did hire black people, just turned out they were most, they were all men, but they did hire black people. Then they asked, well, could she prove gender discrimination, right? Is there discrimination against women? And it turned out that General Motors actually did hire women, some women, white women, they did not hire black women. They hired white women for secretarial work, front office work, the typical kind of mad men place where women show up um, in workforces. As far as the court was concerned, because General Motors did hire blacks and did hire women, Emma and her sisters couldn't prove race and gender discrimination, right? Couldn't prove one, couldn't prove the other, so her case was dismissed. Now, this seemed to be a strange story to me, because it was clear that just because General Motors hired blacks, it didn't mean that Emma wasn't discriminated against as a black who was a woman. And just because they hired women didn't mean that Emma wasn't discriminated against as a woman who was black. Why was this so hard for a court to see? Why was it so difficult to imagine that a black woman could experience a form of discrimination that neither black men nor white women would experience? Why was that so difficult? Beyond that, why did the court interpret what Emma wanted to do, which was to put these two causes of action together in order to tell her story as insufficiently responsive to the law. In fact, what the court said was that to allow Emma to say, okay, I want to put race and gender discrimination together to make a claim that what's happening to me is compound discrimination. What the court said to that was, that would be preferential treatment for Emma de Graffenried. Why? No one else gets to put two causes of action together to make a claim. Of course, no one else had to put two causes of action together, right, to be able to tell their story. This is the consequence of a framework that is a non-intersectional framework. It's a way of imagining gender discrimination that assumes that the woman who's being discriminated against has nothing else that holds her back. There are no other barriers but for gender. And it's a frame of race discrimination that does the same with respect to race. So, intersectionality was basically meant to be a word picture to say, look, you don't seem to be able to understand that there are a multitude of ways in which discrimination is experienced outside the typical framework that you have. So we're gonna try to make it plain. We're gonna try to use an everyday metaphor. You go through an intersection every day. Why not use that idea, that metaphor, to help us understand what you can apparently not see. So intersectionality was just a simple tool, a word picture to say, here is what's happening to Emma de Graffenried. She is in a workforce that first is structured along race and along gender. The structure is the roads. And the traffic in the roads are those policies that maintain that structure by saying, Emma, you are a woman and you're a black person, we don't have a place for you. So intersectionality is about 
all of the ways that our social world is structured by race, by gender, and beyond that, by gender identity, by class, by disability, by immigrant status. These are the hard structures in our society, and the traffic are the policies and the consequences that roll through those, tr those structures. If you happen to be on two roads at the same time, or three or four, the likelihood that you are gonna be hit by all of that traffic is great. But here's where the real problem comes in, if that's not problematic enough. The real problem comes when the ambulance shows up to say, we heard there was a traffic accident, and we're coming to lift that person who has been impacted by this traffic and to provide some kind of intervention. The problem is that many of those ambulances that show up um, have one word on them. So the anti-racism ambulance might show up. Um, the feminism might show up. Right? Um, the the anti-homophobia uh, ambulance might show up. And they'll show up and they'll see an accident and say, our insurance only applies if we can figure out if the thing that's happened is solely because of gender, or solely because of race traffic, or solely because of class. And where there's an intersectional accident, it's hard to actually unravel whether it was one thing that caused it, as is the case with Emma de Graffenry. So the problem that intersectionality was trying to highlight wasn't just the fact that if you are multiply burdened, the likelihood is you will encounter the combined impact of that multiple burden. That's part one. Part two is those that you look to for protection, for solidarity, for intervention, from the law to social justice advocates to, yes, philanthropy, will many times not recognize your intersectional injury and abandon you to be taken up by some other uh, partial intervention. So intersectionality has a message, not just to General Motors, but to the lawyers, not just to General Motors, to the judge, and to those who fund the efforts to create meaningful interventions. So intersectionality asks us to look at how patriarchy, classism, homophobia, racism, xenophobia, how they all come together to create particular kinds of uh, risks, particular challenges, particular harms. And it also encourages us to ask, are our conceptions of what social justice looks like, are our conceptions of what intervention should look like, are our conceptions of who we should be funding adequate to the task of addressing intersectional harms? That's the question. And that's the question that I want to raise with us. So I've been talking about frames. I've been talking about law. I've been talking about social justice. Now I want to talk a little bit more directly about the role of philanthropy in advancing frames that sometimes make it difficult to address intersectional harms. For many years, um, there were frames around racial justice that in some ways were non-intersectional, non-structural, and that made it difficult to deal with the broader way that racial injustice was perpetuated in this country. Philanthropy shaped research and intervention focusing on race as a problem of prejudice primarily, a problem of ignorance primarily, a problem of individual failure to see each other as whole human beings, a problem of the failure to be colorblind. So committed were mainstream philanthropists to this idea that when it came time to gather research and dollars to actually learn about racial inequality in American society. The person that was chosen to do this work with the equivalent of many millions of dollars was Gunnar Myrdal, a Swede, with very little exposure to race in the United States. 
He was the one that created the idea of the American dilemma. Right? Race as the American dilemma, otherwise known as the white man's burden. On the other side was W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, a scholar activist whose groundbreaking work on the Philadelphia Negro and other, uh, on, and reconstruction and many other topics um, was excluded from philanthropic support, excluded because the assumption was he was too invested. He was a scholar academic who was an activist. He wasn't dispassionate enough. We needed someone who didn't know anything to come and tell us stuff, rather than someone who knew something about the actual problem. Right? So, so what, what did that, what has that wrought over the course of history? Well, now we have organizations and we have pundits calling for racial justice advocacy that builds stronger connections between racial justice and economic justice. Well, as it turns out, these folks were around for the entire 20th century. They just weren't funded by philanthropic concerns uh, as we have been talking about. So what we wound up with was an approach to racial justice that was a little bit like Rodney King saying, can't we all just get along? Right? Can't we just all see each other for who we are? These were charitable interventions at best. They were uplift strategies rather than efforts to actually dismantle and rebuild to create stronger, more resilient and effective institutions to realize the objectives of social justice, of race and gender equality in our country. In the broader international community, funding for women's rights has sometimes been framed as modernization, just a little bit beyond civilization. Sometimes through the savior lens, development discourses, for example, that fail to target the vestiges of colonialism and the destabilizing functions of mass extraction of people and of resources and leaving what's left behind as somehow a product of culture or a product of just natural tendencies towards poverty. Those kind of approaches do the same kind of harm to broader possibilities as the Myrdal approach did to racial justice in the United States. So as we can see, the, the failure to think broadly, the failure to have lenses and frames that allow us to see wider aspects of the problem, the failure to have the picture of the cows with the clouds in the sky has shaped philanthropy, both in terms of race and in terms of gender. They continue to produce interventions that erase invisible dynamics that are intersectional and are cumulative. Now, you might be happy to note that these examples are 50 years old or more. Um, you might be excited about the fact that we all now talk intersectionality. We all now talk about cross silos. We all talk about the need to build better collaborations. We talk about um, the need to build partnerships. The question is, what does that mean we have to now be prepared to do? We talk the talk. So what does it mean in terms of walking the walk? Well, as I just mentioned with respect to intersectionalities interrogation, it's not just our enemies, it's not just discrimination that we have to have some real tough conversations with. Sometimes it's people on the same side of the aisle. Sometimes it's our closest friends. Sometimes it's the people that we admire. Sometimes it's the people that we tend to march with under the same banner. But the banner isn't quite as inclusive as it needs to be. So what are some examples of the banner not being quite as inclusive as it needs to be? Well, in the racial justice terrain, for example, Racial justice framing has been influenced over the last 20 years or so uh, by 
um, an approach to racial justice that primarily looks at conditions that lead to mass incarceration and negative outcomes, primarily for men and boys of color. So gender has indeed come into race discourse, as many of us have hoped, but sometimes through a framework that elevates the ways that only half of the population is targeted and undermined, but not the ways that women and girls who are similarly situated are impacted. So initiatives like the Executive Alliance for Men and Boys, NBK and others, they are important. They are important interventions. They lift up the need to pay attention to racial disparities, but at the same time, those initiatives sometimes thoughtlessly frame the impact of women and girls as less significant, sometimes erase the same kinds of circumstances, and sometimes obscure those that are different. So the challenge for us is to address this exclusion not by simply creating parallel institutions, sometimes that's useful, but sometimes we have to actually challenge the frame. Challenging the frame means that trickle-down approaches to racial justice, trickle-down approaches to gender justice just won't cut it. We can't simply assume that girls or women will be better off in the by and by if we don't focus on job creation and security and wealth for them under the belief that Ozzie and Harriet will eventually come back together and women will benefit from that very uh, marriage uh, of male and female, not to mention the ways that that frame excludes queer families and gender non-conforming people. So we've got to be paying attention to what gets missed by certain kinds of frames. On the gender side of the equation, there has to be more conversation about the need to focus on race. Now, we have been relatively, I think, more successful in talking the language of all women and girls. We have been as successful at making it clear that we have a list many times. Um, of all the various ways that women and girls um, are uh, distinguished from each other. But generally speaking, we're still kind of nervous about having targeted programs for women and girls of color, targeted programs uh, for uh, undocumented women and girls. We don't call our initiatives um, women and girls of color in the same way that men and boys of color um, are actually denoted. Why is that? What is the reservation that we have about saying that there are some unique problems that we face as women as a product of race or ethnicity? What is the reservation that we have around that? One of the challenges is to come up with um, a, a, a framework that allows us to draw that attention without the typical way that that attention is drawn for men and boys. One of the, one of the more troubling aspects of the frame for men and boys is it's often based on the idea of building a coalition between those who fear them and those who fear for their lives. Yeah? That's where it comes from. But what happens to women and girls of color when nobody fears them? Yeah, what happens when that hook is not there? We have to rethink these frames. We have to go beyond the idea of fear as the main point of departure for our racial justice interventions and instead think about what's necessary to build the conditions to enhance the well-being of entire communities. That's a different point of departure. Now, it's not just racial justice that has to rethink its lens. Um, it's also uh, questions about how we think about gender justice. One of the most significant advances in the last um, four years in sexual violence has been the focus on sexual violence on college campuses. And that's been an important conversation, right? But let's face it, if we were to actually think about how sexual violence impacts homeless women, poor women, women of color, trans women, 
we wouldn't primarily be talking about college campuses. We would be talking about what happens in the streets, in public housing projects, in employment offices, everywhere where women and femmes are vulnerable. And that, in fact, sometimes includes in police cars, in prisons, and in jails. Right? So this is another moment where the frame works as long as we're not asking more questions. When we start asking more questions, it becomes clear that the frame is inadequate. We've got to broaden it. We've got to deepen it. And while we're talking about frames, it's very interesting to ask whether this is now the face of intersectional erasure. You know, there's that book that says um, all the women are white, all the blacks are men. I've talked about that so far. But when it comes to when and where we talk about women of color, it seems that all the women and girls of color live outside the United States. Because <laughs> a lot of people who actually have targeted programs targeted them solely outside the U.S. is that we don't have a problem here as well. In fact, there is more in common between many women of color here in the United States and women of color in the global south than what's in common between women of color and white women in the United States, right? When it comes to housing insecurity, when it comes to employment, when it comes to health, these are things that are happening here. There was a program that was created called Let Girls Learn. A lot of people thought that that was in response to uh, Why We Can't Wait, that said, look, we have to focus on women and girls of color here, too. And people said, well, Let Girls Learn doesn't. Let Girls Learn is a Peace Corps project, which means it doesn't operate in the United States. Right? So as we are casting our eye abroad, it's important to link up and to understand and have a framework that allows us to see how women and girls of color um, are targeted and vulnerable at every place they exist. While we are doing that, what we need to break is the cycle of invisibility. And when I say cycle of invisibility, what I mean is to say, well, look, if we start by framing a problem and not acknowledging, highlighting, elevating how and where race and other forms of social inequality impact women and girls, it means that we won't have the information necessary. So when it's time to bring problems and interventions up to scale, there is no information about what can be impactful for women and girls of color, which reinforces the problem in the first place. A good example um, of that problem is, in fact, some of the rationales that are sometimes used uh, for excluding women and girls from some of the existing uh, men and boys programs. Um, some of the arguments say that actually uh, men and boys have exclusive uh, challenges that aren't similarly shared uh, by women and girls. But when you actually look at some of the things that are claimed as the exclusive reason why we only need to talk about boys, 75% of the conditions that are said to impact men and boys exclusively actually impact women and girls as well. The data don't support the idea that there's a huge distinction between what's happening with men and boys. Let me just give you an example. One argument is boys and men of color are more likely than their peers to be born into low-income families and live in concentrated poverty, to have teenage mothers to live with one or no parent to attend high-poverty, poor-performing schools, et cetera. More likely than whom? <laughs> Not more likely than their sisters who are growing up in the same households parented by the same mothers who are struggling in the same social economic conditions, going to the same low-funded schools, having the same limited workforce opportunities. This is a moment where a frame is undermining our ability to think collaboratively and coherently about how to move forward. We decided that we were going to take a look into one of the most significant frames, the school to prison pipeline, just to see where girls were situated. And we had heard and we knew that boys were three times more likely, black boys were three times more likely to be suspended from school. And that was one of the reasons why there was no conversation about where girls fit into it until we started to actually interview and look. And we found actually by the Department of Education's own data, black girls are six times more likely to be suspended from school than their white female counterparts. 
In one of the areas that we looked at, black girls were 53 times more likely to be expelled. We actually had to make that up because there wasn't one white girl in New York in the year that we studied who was actually expelled from school. So to do the ratio, you had to imagine, imagine if you will, a white girl who did something that was serious enough to cause her to be expelled from school. That's how we got the ratio. Um, but you know, data doesn't tell us the whole story. We actually have to sit down and talk to women and girls and find out what's happening to them. What we found is that girls get pushed out from zero tolerance policies, they get pushed out from the failure to um, support them when they've been victimized by sexual harassment. We found that girls often feel that their accomplishments aren't celebrated, you know, largely because of the assumption that girls are gonna do okay when left alone. Girls do not do okay when left alone. So they detach themselves from school. And we also found that parenting responsibilities and childcare responsibilities that fall disproportionately on girls, whether they're their own children or someone else's, actually contribute to their separation from school. So when we think about push out, and we only think about it as a boy problem, we miss all of this. At the same time, when we think about school and education from a gender lens, many times we don't think about it from a race and class lens. So many of these testimonies that we heard from girls um, don't turn up in many of the research projects that look at how girls are experiencing classrooms. It depends on what girls we're talking about and where. I said data isn't enough. What is enough is providing opportunities for women and girls to tell their stories to communities, to their own families, to their networks, and to people who are in decision-making positions. One of the things that the African American Policy Forum decided to do in the face of this misframing of the injustices facing women and girls of color was to provide precisely the same thing that had been in play for 20 years that helped build this framework of awareness around the crisis facing men and boys. Over the last 20 years, there have been blue ribbon commissions. There have been uh, hearings at the congressional level, at the city council level. There is even an initiative by the president to say this is important, we've got to pay attention to this. There have not been those same opportunities for women and girls. And as a consequence, it led people to believe that women and girls were doing okay. Even in communities, they could see that women and girls were not doing okay. So what we decided to do was to have a series of hearings all across the country where we would partner with local organizations to provide an opportunity for women and girls to come forward in a hearing-like setting, regardless of whether it was official or not. Most of the time, it wasn't official. But we make it official by making it relevant what women and girls of color have to say. And we've learned a lot over the last two and a half years in partnership um, with uh, people and organizations like uh, Impact Hub here in Oakland that's having another town hall in two weeks. <laughs> and Girls for Gender Equity in New York that had the fourth and fifth town hall with us. This, this process of telling stories isn't just about testimonial, it's about making our partners, our allies, our communities, and our elected officials aware of the actual conditions of our lives so they can no longer say, sorry, we didn't know. Sorry, we didn't know about the fact that there's so much housing insecurity. Sorry, we didn't know about the fact that so many are being pushed out of school. Sorry, we didn't know about the loss of income and wealth over the last 10 years. Sorry, we didn't know about how violence is the single most significant risk factor for mass incarceration. Sorry, we didn't know that black women lose their children at a rate that's multiple times of any other group. Sorry we didn't know about the long-term consequences of family dissolution. Sorry we didn't know that spending money to support all families, regardless of whether they're male-centered or female-centered, is what's necessary to enhance the well-being of our entire community. Sorry we didn't know.
So this is important work for expanding the public will. It's important work for telling families that when your girl comes home suspended from school, don't assume that she's acted out, even though you know what's happening to your boys. Have the talk with the girls as well as having to talk with the boys. Recognize that all of them are subject to institutional consequences. It was important for us to lift up these voices, but also important to us that these voices have an opportunity to come together to be aware of the fact that they are part of a broader community of women and girls across the United States who are stepping forward and saying, my life matters too. My life is important. So we've brought these women together over the course of the last three summers to Vassar College where they can learn, engage in political in education, but also develop a, an artistic expression, a skill, an ability to tell their story. So we have uh, documentary filmmaking, we have dramatic interpretation, we have songwriting, and importantly, we have, do you want to create a town hall capacity? Do you want to learn how to do it? Here's the place to come. The idea is to spread the capacity, the willingness, and the opportunity to seek accountability from our partners, our allies, and importantly, to our funders. So I want to, to end by saying a few things about intersectionality domestically and internationally. Um, it's our challenge to try to see intersectionally, but it's often difficult to see intersections, particularly when part of the vulnerability is just taken as a natural way of life, just the background way in which our worlds are organized. Let me give you a couple examples internationally. Um, there's a lot of information and there's efforts now to deal with caste, for example. Uh, caste violence is an important uh, human rights issue, but many times it's not framed as an intersectional issue. Why? Many of the people who are subject to caste violence are women. Women. Women who encounter violence when they go to wells to draw water. Women who encounter violence when they seek wood for, for fire. Women who encounter other women. We don't have a frame for that. And partly because we see the women's role as just being natural. That's just what they're supposed to do, right? So what's intersectional about it is often missing. These are intersectional matters of violence. First, the fact that women have that responsibility in the first place, they're intersectional because of global development, leaves many communities in a situation where women have to carry a disproportionate burden of just keeping food and water on the table for their families. And it's not just India. If we go to Central Africa, if we go to any place where there are refugee camps, we will see intersectionality playing out there. There's a reason why refugee camps are one of the most dangerous places for women to be because of their responsibilities, because there's no protection. So intersectionality is a global phenomenon. We can come up with any number of examples. It's just important that we not think that it's just there, and it's important that we think that it's not just here. And finally, when we think about intersectionality in terms of violence and in terms of racial justice, it's important to recognize some of the issues that fall through the cracks of both of those. So when you talk about uh, police violence, you sel seldom talk about sexual violence. When you talk about sexual violence, you seldom talk about police violence. But as it turns out, sexual violence is the second most common complaint against police officers. Bet you didn't know that, right? Daniel Holtzclaw is an example, a police officer in, um, in, in Oklahoma who was accused of raping 13 black women. 13 black women. Why did he think he could get away with it? They were poor. They were black. Many were system involved. Many were chemically dependent. These are intersectional vulnerabilities that led him to believe that he could rape them with impunity. So all of these are examples of intersectional failure. They are all e examples of how endangerment often falls through our cracks. I want to 
end with Say Her Name, basically um, because Say Her Name is the embodiment of the effort to lift up the fact that women have fallen through the cracks of police violence. It's a clear uh, uh, illustration of vulnerability of black women, girls as young as seven, women as old as 93 have been killed by the police. They've been killed in their living rooms, on the streets, in their cars, in their bedrooms, in front of their children, in front of their parents. They've been killed when their family members sought help in mental crises. They've been killed when they were targeted. They've been killed when they are alone. They've been killed driving while black, shopping while black, being homeless while black, having a domestic dispute while black. They've been killed using a cell phone turning into the NSA parking lot, driving near the White House with an infant strapped in the back seat of the car. And that they are women does virtually nothing to counter some of the narratives that they deserved what they got. We have been fighting against this invisibility as a way of drawing awareness to what happens when our frames are inadequate, a way of drawing attention to those families who are suffering in obscurity, to draw attention to the need to build an anti-police violence practice that includes the way that women are made vulnerable in addition to men. This is part of a lens that is an equitable lens we need to think about these interventions as a way of building more equity, not just in terms of resources, but attention. We need to think about moving from charity to empowerment, away from trickle-down ideas to uplift and transformation. And we need to fund in ways that encourage independence and truth-telling. Is there someone that you all can count on to tell you the truth? Is there some way that you can place grantees outside the constant performance of fidelity to your mission, to allow your grantees to educate you? In the end, intersectionality is about empowerment. It's about the capacity of women and all other persons to find meaning and purpose in their struggle for better lives. Our work has sometimes taken us to places and to people who inspire us, who demand that we keep going, even when our stories might get drowned out by the prevailing frames. And I want to share, in conclusion, one of my sheroes with you. Vicki Coles Adore, she was the auntie mama of India Beatty, a young black woman who was killed by Norfolk police just in March of 2016. We reached out to Vicki and her mom to bring them together on our Say Her Name weekend, which we bring all the mothers of women killed by the police together. Vicki grieved as openly as she lived. She impacted all of us by saying that India told her one day she was going to bring her to New York. She never thought that this was going to be the way she would bring her there. It was her birthday. She cried as much as she laughed. She told us stories about India um, and kept us in stitches. She was a woman who lived fully in everything that she was feeling in every commitment that she had. She was just with us at the summer camp in Poughkeepsie not only a month ago. And just to give you a sense of her humor, um, she said that being at the camp is sort of like a crazy recipe. AAPF has this weird ability to combine things that you don't think go together. Like someone saying, I'm going to mix broccoli and onions and maybe a coconut cake. And you say, what? You hear it and you think you've got to be crazy. I'm not eating that. But they have a way of bringing things that you don't think go together and making it taste delicious. And in saying that, this camp, say her name, it also helped me to magnify and define my purpose now, not just because of India. After seeing these black women who gave, who are targets on their heads, my purpose is to make sure that not one gets lost to police violence, to racism, to people just treating them differently because of their color of their skin. I spoke to Vicki Sunday night, and she told me no matter what happened to her, we had to keep going. I didn't like the sound of that. I encouraged her to get back with us as soon as possible. But Vicki seemed to know that her days were limited. She passed away about six hours after we had that conversation. And then looking back, 
we went to the march together, and her, her statement about why she was there just seemed so prescient. I want to leave you with it. I want to leave you with a gift of her passion, her commitment to take her own tragedy and turn it into an opportunity to lift up the lives of all women everywhere. For so long, we as women were not allowed to have anything to do with battle, protecting our communities, protecting our country. We didn't have a voice. I refuse. I refuse as a woman. I refuse as a black woman. I refuse as a human to shut up any longer. I'm not just a soldier for India Beatty. I'm a soldier for every one of our children that have been unjustifiably taken away from us. And I will stand up if it means my death. I will not stop speaking out until I have no voice. And being a soldier for a cause that I know is needed and that can be accomplished if enough voices stand up and speak out, that's everything to me. Because even in death, going to that march and walking with all my sisters, thousands and thousands of my sisters, even in death, I would be a part of history. Thank you.